Hey, can you just give us kind of your general thoughts on the class and, and maybe speak to some of the challenges that uh, were obviously there for you and everybody else in college football this year? Thanks. Yep. You know, we're excited about, about this group of, of young men um, that are joining us. Um, feel really good about each one of them individually as, as players. Um, we got a, a bunch of guys that are going to you know, be future you know, players here for us and really good players at, at Penn State. Um, felt like, you know, we did a lot in terms of being balanced across the board. Uh, there's a few spots that we'll probably continue to, to look for here come February and then also on the transfer market. Um, in terms of, market, in terms of the, you know, the, the challenges, um, we all face them. Everybody in college football faced the challenges with, with COVID. And I think um, across the world, we're all facing the, you know, the difficulties of it. But like anything in life, you've got to, you know, handle those challenges head on. Um, you know, one of the great things about Penn State is, when a kid comes on campus, um, he gets the feel of how special this place really truly is. Um, the people here, the environment here, um, our coaching staff um, as well, um, and that's that's missing a little bit in an area in an era when you're only able to do Zoom calls. Um, but we, we did a bunch of them. Um, felt like you know we were able to hold on to a class that was you know pretty well kind of along its way um, as, as the COVID things started. Um, and then kind of picked up steam, um, right. You know, that things got going there and, and did, I think we did a good job of, of keeping these guys, you know, connected to our staff, talking to our staff all the way through, um, the process coaches, um, support staff, recruiting staff, um, strength coaches, nutritionists, academic staff, all those people we were in close contact with all the way through. And then the other piece is, is the younger classes being able to expand our reaches. It's interesting. You know, the one thing it's a little bit different. Um, it's, it's very challenging on the, the senior class, the 21 class, in terms of being able to get those connections to get a kid to say yes and ultimately sign with you. But it actually kind of opened up some avenues for some younger kids in the sense that whether wherever the kid was in the country, he was as close to us as he was to anywhere else. So I think our pool is it, it's, it's pretty good because now where they might have been taking a visit on a Saturday somewhere closer to home, now we were able to you know, get them on a Zoom call um, with our staff and different groups you know, in our organization. And so now we're maybe real realistic options for them going forward. Ryan Sutter, BWI. Andy, thanks for the time. Um, can you just talk a little bit about you know, having all your guys at camp this year, or last year, uh, and just having that base, uh, I think a good chunk of your class, camped um and then of course just how hard was it then finding accurate information over the next year um you know just just what did that do for you guys having all those guys in camp yeah obviously you guys have, have seen over the years we've placed a huge emphasis on getting kids to camp um a couple of reasons for it from an evaluation standpoint it's, it's a, a major factor for us and being able to feel comfortable that they check all the boxes um physically um as football players um, and this class, in, in the end, it isn't that much different. Over half of the class was was here for camps. And I think that's an important piece of it. Um, but it was a challenge in the sense that we probably would have had more guys that on this list that would have come to camp um, had, had had we been able to have them for this past this past summer. Um, in, in terms of you know being able them us to evaluate them. And also for them to be able to evaluate us, you know, we, we feel confident if a kid comes here and our coaching staff gets to be around them for a day in camp, they get to see, you know, what it's like to, to play for that coach. And I think that's a, a, a huge value um, in, in the recruiting process. Look, look forward to getting back to the days when we can have camp, hopefully this summer. Um, it, it's a significant part of, of how we, we operate as, as a staff. Sean Fitz, Lions 247, Greg Pickle, you're on deck. Andy, thanks for taking the time. The beard's coming in nicely, by the way. Uh, you mentioned the transfer portal a little bit earlier, kind of things changing there with the uh, the, the rules and the, the immediate eligibility. How does that change your approach as the staff to handling the transfer portal, and, and what are you guys thinking in terms of, of hitting that in the next couple of months? Yeah, the transfer portal has obviously changed things dramatically in college football. Um in terms of everybody seeing it to start with, you know, like when the transfer portal came into, into place a couple of years ago, now the whole world sees who's on, who's on the, the market, if you will. Um, the big change that we, we think is likely to happen here shortly is that kids will have immediate eligibility. And that's going to be another ramp up to, you know, what the transfer portal means. Um, I think we all kind of realize that 
in the past um, for us at Penn State. Transfers were not a, a big part of, of, of our overall recruiting process. That will change. Um, we're not going to make a, a full-time living in terms of all of our players are going to come from the transfer portal by any stretch of the imagination. We're still going to you know, do the majority of our recruiting from the high school ranks. But we're going to be active um, there's, in the transfer portal, and we're going to be looking for guys that can help us you know, fill gaps. And then also, in addition to filling gaps that we may have on our roster, create competition. You know, we're, we're looking for guys that are going to come in here um, that have maybe been other places. Some may have had the success they wanted somewhere else, and now are trying to you know, move up, if you will. Others may not have had the, you know, the early success that they hoped for, but still have you know, bright futures. Um, they, we hope to bring those guys in here um, and have them be you know, competition for the guys on the roster that also fill some voids. I think the other aspect of the transfer portal that's interesting, when you recruit a high school kid, you are getting someone who you know at the vast majority of positions, you're going to have to develop into a player that you want him to be. Uh, on the transfer portal, he may already be along the way um, to you know who he is as a player, being in the college weight room, you know, being physically advanced. It's a big adjustment. You talk to anybody that plays college football, no matter how good you are, how talented you may be that freshman year, it's a big adjustment. You're, you're going against grown men. Whereas you take someone in the transfer portal um, from, from another school who has, you know, that foundation, that base, they're a little bit older. Um, they have a chance to you know, jump in right away and, and be competitive in terms of roster spots, in terms of you know, being able to get starting roles. Um, so there's going to be those older guys um, that may come in and be on your roster for one to two years and, and they fill those, those voids. And then you're going to have the other ones that, I, I, unfortunately, it's probably going to be a lot of kids because of the immediate eligibility that we, we expect that they may not have the, the freshman experience that they wanted somewhere else. And now they're going to be looking around and we're going to still have to groom them up. So it's, it's kind of twofold. You're looking at the older guys, the kind of quick fixes and still the younger guys to continue to develop. Um, and so it, it, it provides an opportunity for us. Again, like I said, we will still primarily recruit from high schools, but when it's going to be beneficial to us, we'll, we'll go to that transfer portal and try and find some guys. Let's go to Greg Pickle, Penn Live and Audrey Snyder. You're on deck. Andy, thanks for your time. Where do you guys think you're at in terms of space now moving into February? And how does both the extra year of eligibility for your guys because of the COVID uh, rule that they can take advantage of and also the likelihood of the one-time transfer rule passing impact that? Yeah, so the, the guys that, you know, the seniors that can come back, um, fortunately, the way the NCAA has it set up, they will not count against our 85 number, um, max number for next year. So that allows us to, in terms of space available, not factor them in, not, not worry about are they taking a space because they won't take a space. What they will do it if we do have some guys that decide they want to come back is they'll be, you know, where our pulls on our roster may be. Um, obviously, if a guy comes back that you weren't expecting to come back, you may be stronger at a position than you were otherwise were thinking. So if we're still moving forward in February looking for, you know, additional guys, whether, again, it's transfer portal or whether it's high school guys, um, a position of somebody that comes back, you might not have, have to place as much emphasis on it because you have that fix. Um, on the flip side, if someone leaves for the NFL, um, now because of the immediate eligibility, you have quicker solutions to someone who you may or may not have known was going to be leaving for you. In terms of projecting the numbers, um, we're going to be like you know everybody else in the country. We're going to be monitoring it. Um, and, and trying to figure out we're having conversations with our guys now to try and get a feel for where they're at. We'll know very shortly, um, you know, where a good number of them are thinking if we're going to have guys that are going to decide they want to transfer elsewhere or if they're going to leave for the draft. So we'll, you know, coming out of this here, coming out of our last, um, our last couple of games, um, you know, we'll, we'll have a feel for, you know, where our exact needs are at. Let's go to Audrey Snyder, the athletic and Rich Garcella. You're on deck. Hey, Andy, appreciate the time. Um, I'm just wondering, obviously, it was such a big year in Pennsylvania. Um, why do you think Pennsylvania was such a challenge for you guys this year? Um, and I know camps, obviously, are super important to what you do, but do you think Penn State could potentially stand to offer kids earlier in-state in the process, or is that something you guys want to try to reevaluate? You know, we're continuing, continually involving, you know, as a, as a staff and trying to figure out the best ways to recruit Pennsylvania and recruit the rest of the country for that matter. Um, I think if, if you follow along closely, we probably have got more offers out now um, in, in the younger classes than we did um, in, in previous classes. There, there's a, a variety of reasons for that. 
Um, an element of it is, is being a little bit more aggressive early on. And a little bit of it is we feel like these upcoming classes um, have a, a more deeper pool of players here in the state. Um, we're in a state that is, has got great high school football, but the reality is the numbers in the state have gone down a little bit over time, not every year, but it kind of cycles up and cycles down. So there's a premium in the years where there's not as many um, top end guys that we feel confident in. You've got to hit on them. And we realize that we've got to hit on those guys. And it's, it's a challenge when you don't. And it's obviously it's frustrating to us if we do miss. Um, but in years where they're bigger, you want to make sure you get that high percentage again. And if you feel like we're on the track to do that in the future. Let's go to Rich Garcella, Redding Eagle, and Tyler Donahue. You're on deck. Andy, thanks for your time. I want to follow up on Audrey's question. So in the 21 cycle, what did you learn or what didn't you do well with regards to the top prospects in Pennsylvania? Um, and what have you uh, applied? You've obviously got a good start on the 22 class with kids in state. What have you applied to that group? Well, just to start with, we've offered more guys um, early on in the process. Um, I think that that's an element of it. Um, I, I think there's there's a, a variety of, of reasons. I think we all look for, hey, this is the reason. Um, we, we've done, you know, over the course of time, over you know, our time here, we've done very well in, in the state as, a, as an aggregate, but there's going to be some, some peaks and some valleys. Um, every kid is different. Um, and obviously we've had some, some really top end kids, a couple of top end kids that have gotten out of the state and we, we can't allow that to happen. We've got to look at each of those cases individually and figure, okay, in the future, when we have a similar type kid, what is it about his recruitment that is going to make him pick Penn state or pick somewhere else? Um, and that, that's kind of what we do. We go back and we analyze how, how it, how it's played out in the past and what we want to do for the future. Howard Donahue, Lions 247 and John Petitnock, you're on deck. Hi, Andy. Thank you for your time. Um, you guys are preparing for Big Ten football, but I, I think you're only maybe four weeks away from having uh, several new freshmen on campus and joining this roster. Given the circumstances, what kind of a, an early enrollee experience can that class anticipate? Um, and, and, you know, if, if there's a spring practice or not, regardless, what do you think they can gain from that first semester on campus? Yeah, whether we have spring ball or not, we're obviously hoping that we do. Um, they're going to gain the experience in the weight room. You know, it's a it's a you know a chance to get on campus, get trained like they've never been trained before. Um, and regardless of how classes have been, it's going to be a different experience. You know, COVID has been a different experience for everybody. If you were a high school senior this year, you had a different senior year of football of classes than any other senior that that we can recall in, in history. And it'll be the same thing for mid-years. Um, they may come in here and they may be doing a bunch of online classes and, and those will be, you know, challenges for them, but it's always a challenge when you arrive on campus. And so they'll, they'll make that their, their normal and, and they'll figure out how to work through it. And we're going to help develop them as players um, and, and as people um, along the way. Uh, we, we feel real confident in our development staff here. Coach Galt and his, and his crew do a great job with these guys, both from a, you know, a weight lifting standpoint, but also a running standpoint. Um, that They'll be in better condition um, than they've ever been in their life, um, and they'll be you know closer to being able to play for us. It, it's still a challenge, even for mid-year enrollees, to play as true freshmen, um, but these guys will have definitely a, a leg up um, on, on the rest of the class in terms of being able to play early. John Petitnock, the football letter, and Nubias Wilborn, you're on deck. Hey, good afternoon, Andy. Appreciate your time today. Hey. The, the football team incorporated some videos from alumni on the social media channels today, Keegan-Michael Key, Larry Spencer, among others. What's the impact of the Penn State alumni network in recruiting, not just for the recruits, but for their, their families and, and also for their parents especially? Yeah, you know, obviously Penn State's Alumni Association is, is the largest and most powerful in, in the world. I think that's something for us, um, for our kids as they graduate, it is a huge benefit for them um, as, as they leave here. And I think they realize that coming in, the, the kids that typically pick a place like Penn State, they, they're looking at more than just the football field. And, and that alumni support for their future in their career, whether it's if they play in the NFL or after the NFL, we all realize that you know, the guys that play in the NFL, they're going to have a career after that. Uh, they may have enough money to retire, but, but 
they're not going to probably retire right after they, they're done playing ball. Um, and so having that, those, those connections, it, it's really special to see, you know, how much people care about this place um, and, and what that means for people down the road, the connections, the, you know, the job opportunities, just that, that fraternity of, of, of Penn State. And the parents really, like you said, they, they gravitate to that because they, they understand as, as a kid, as a high school kid, you don't know what it's going to be like to be 40. You don't know what it's like to be 30 and looking for a job, but your parents do because, because they went through that. And so that resonates with them, the Alumni Association, you know, the alumni network that we have here. I think one really interesting aspect of, of all of this is that as we get into name, image, and likeness, it's going to be an even bigger factor for us on the recruiting side. Um, it was important in the past and it's always been important, but it's going to be a bigger factor moving forward than it's ever been because the community, the Penn State community, whether it's Letterman, whether it's alumni, whether it's fans, are going to have a bigger impact on our recruitment than they've ever had before with name, image, and likeness in the sense that those connections, those social media followers, there's a value to that for us in recruiting. And it's, it's one that you don't necessarily put a, a dollar value on, but in terms of our ability to recruit kids, we've got a great setup here for it. But at the same time, we can't rest on our laurels and say just because we're, we're we have this huge network that it's just going to automatically work for it, for us. Um, we're going to have to we're going to be calling on the alumni to help us throughout this process and, and helping us recruit kids. Tobias Wilborn, Pittsburgh Post Gazette, Mike Foreman, you're on deck. Well, Andy, first of all, hello, good to meet you. Um, thanks for the time. You as well. And you actually led me right into the question I was going to ask you. Um, what are some of the ways you could probably even elaborate a little bit more on the name, image, and license and stuff? How I know technically this year you can't fully enact it, but what kind of infrastructure you set up to get it going for when it does become a thing and how important is that going forward? Yeah, it, it's, it's a great question. Um, still, we can't use it this year, what you mentioned. Um, still very fluid because the rules in terms of what exactly it's going to look like aren't set yet. So there's an element of, you have a plan, but that plan has to be flexible. Um, I think the key things, you know, going forward is what do we have that is our strength? And then how do we leverage that strength? Um, the alumni network, the number of people that care about Penn State and care about Penn State football um, is surpasses really anybody in the country. And to be able to leverage the individual fan um, the individual alumni and, and their value for us in the recruiting process, whether it's via social media, you know, clicking follow on a, on a prospect or on a player has value for us now in recruiting. Whereas in the past, it, it may not have. Um, having someone who works at a local business in someone's hometown that cares about Penn State and, hey, we may have a, a small commercial if that's something that the NCAA is going to allow okay, well, I'm going to think about the Penn State player that's from, from our hometown, but let's get him on to, to be our, our spokesman for a 30-second you know, spot. All of those things, making sure that, that everybody understands the importance of it um, and then reaching out and, and trying to make sure that you know, our kids and, and there's going to be some elements of how much can we be involved or can we be involved at all, but making sure our players know what those avenues are, who's out there to potentially facilitate that for them in the future. Let's go to Mike Foreman with statecollege.com and Peter Terpstra. You're on deck. Thanks, Greg. Andy, how much credence do you put into national rankings? <laughs> good, good question. Um, what I would say is as a whole, um, I think they're really good. I think the recruiting services do a great job of, of recruiting, or not recruiting, but evaluating prospects as an overall group. Obviously, we have to look at each individual kid separately. And how do they fit us? What do we see in that individual prospect? So do we, you know, hey, this kid's ranked this, so we have to offer them? Absolutely not. But do they have it, you know, pretty well down in terms of the overall group of the kids in the country? Yes. And we're going to, we, we follow along as much or more than anybody to find out who those kids are um, and trying to figure out, okay, should we offer this kid? If, if a school, you know, let's just pick a small school in Florida, offers a kid in Florida, we may not be as familiar with that kid, but we need to look at him. If that kid gets a ranking out, out of Florida or wherever, 
we need to look at that kid. So, yeah, we, we put a, a, a good amount of credence in it in terms of the aggregate, not necessarily the individual ranking. Go to Peter Terpstra, WTAJ, and Ryan Parsons. You're on deck. Hey, um, Penn State has this certain it factor when you guys get get uh, prospects on campus, um, whether it be the wideout or a spring game or, or whatnot. Um, do you guys think you did a, a good job of trying to present that kind of it factor or magic, so to speak, uh, from afar? Um, and what kind of things is is that? Uh, what what kind of things can you do to, I mean, to present? that it factor via zoom or whatnot. Yeah. You know, you just, you describe it as an it factor. Um, one of the things that I, I might switch it a little bit in, you know, in terms of terminology and I would describe it as a feel, um, in terms of a kid comes here for a whiteout. What does he feel? What do his, what do his parents feel? Um, a kid goes to a restaurant downtown, um, in, in state college and what, what's the vibe? How does he feel? Does he feel like this is the right place? When he meets a professor or he meets, um, obviously, our staff, how, how, do, how do they feel um, about the place? Because you can have a laundry list of these are my requirements um, as a prospect. But I think we all know, and a lot of decisions we make in our life, that feel is, is really the one that probably trumps a lot of the other things. Because all those checklist things, they contribute to your feel. Um, so that's a, a huge advantage for us in the recruiting process because when you get here, the people are great. You know, the environment is great. A whiteout there isn't a better place in college football um, to, to watch a game than a whiteout here at Penn State at night. It, it's as good as it gets. Um, and you can't completely do that over Zoom. Obviously, the things that we did try to do to, to recreate that as best we can is get, you know, recruits on with all of those people so they can have that conversation and hopefully through – through Zoom, through FaceTime, could feel that, you know, Coach Gall, our strength coach, someone who they're going to spend a ton of time with uh, on campus here in their development, hey, this is a good dude. This guy knows what he's talking about. Not only has he produced a bunch of people that have gone to the Combine and the NFL and had great success, but him and his group, I, I can relate to him. I can he, He's going to be able to push me, push me really hard and, and also love me at the same time. So getting on with those Zooms and making that available to, to recruits and their family members, whether it's the strength coach, the nutritionist, the you know the academic folks, whoever it may be, having that, and I'm going to say you know one on one, you know face to face, if you want to call it face to face or face to screen um, interaction, because I think it, it does come through in a Zoom and a FaceTime. I think we all know in our interactions it's not quite the same, um, but it is there, and I think that's something you have to expose expose the recruits and their families to that. And that's, that's what we try to do. We'll continue to try to do it. Um, and there's a lot of things that we'll take that, you know, we were not doing um, before we had to do the, the Zooms um, that we will, you know, continue to do in the future. Hopefully we'll expand our, our pool of, of prospects. Greg, you're muted. Rookie mistake. Rookie mistake. Um <laughs> Ryan Parsons, Onward State, and Mark Brennan, you're on deck. Hey, Andy. So kind of circling back to the national rankings, um, a lot of people maybe don't look past the star ratings of some of these guys. So um, are there any people or recruits in the 2021 class that you think stand out and you think are going to go beyond maybe their star rating? Yeah. Um, so it's, it's interesting because we love them all. So I don't want to sit here and say that this is the one that you, you have to look at. Um, but what I will say is, there are some guys that probably were not recruited as heavily early on in the process um, that, you know, kind of come along and, and develop into, you know, high end players. And it's interesting because some of them may get bumped towards the end of the recruiting process. You look at a guy, let's, let's say Lonnie white, you know, throughout the entire recruiting process, he starts out as a quarterback. People know he's not a quarterback at the college level moves to, you know, wide receiver plays defense. Um, people, you know, value we value the multi-sport aspect of things for, for a guy like Lonnie um, and so he's a guy that I think is, is an interesting prospect Harrison Wallace another wide receiver um, who you know was at a place that you know didn't get a ton of recruiting traffic but you, you, you watch him and you watch his football highlights and you're really impressed but then go turn on his basketball tape and you see wow this this guy's explosive you know he, he can get off off the ground and, and move around um, he, you know, he's another guy that kind of stands out to me um, Khalil Dinkins here in state, you know, um, a lot of fanfare, um, 
you know, he didn't have it. He didn't, he didn't have that fanfare, you know, kind of in the, in the recruiting process. But you turn on the tape and everything he does athletically, he does it really, really well at a high level. Um, you know, he plays tight end. He plays a, a linebacker defensive end. He's scoring touchdowns on offense. He's scoring touchdowns on defense. He's making plays all over the field. Those things translate to the great players down the road because if you can do a lot of things really, really well, it tends to, to come when you get to college and someone may have this skill set, their their weaknesses kind of tend to get exposed. When you don't have those weaknesses, they really tend to translate to college level. That's why you see, if you look at the NFL draft, you see a bunch of multi-sport guys and guys that play, play both ways, not both as in college, but both as in high school. Time for a couple more for Andy. We got Mark Brennan, fight on stake. Andy, were there a few glue guys in this class? Because I'm sure when when you guys start 0 and 5, it had to be they had to have a lot of people in their ears. But a lot of times in these classes, the kids kind of stick together. Were there guys who kind of were the the, the key to that? You know, as as things got rolling, um, it was it was good to see that group stay together. Um, the NCA made some some rules changes this year because of COVID that allowed us to actually have group recruiting. FaceTimes, group recruiting calls that were not available to us in the past. And so, you know, one of the things that we've been doing for a long time now is almost every weekend, we had the entire group um, on, a, on a Zoom or a FaceTime as a group with a bunch of staff members as, you know, together as that group. They get to be around each other and again, so around each other on a screen, but they get to be, you know, around each other, talk to each other, you know, hang out, have fun on, on that Zoom call. Um, and just that little bit of interaction, you know, weekly, I think helps keep guys together. Um, you know, you got the big personalities in the class, like a Landon Tangwell, you know, for those of you that have, you know, interviewed him, you know, he's a big personality. He's a guy, I think that we, we talk about a glue guy, um, Christian Bayou quarterback, obviously a quarterback's always going to be the Christian's another guy that, that people kind of tend to gravitate to, um, and is, is one of those you know, glue guys. And then we had, we had a bunch of guys, um, from Michigan. And so those guys, they know each other well. They kind of, you know, face similar ups and downs and, and we're able to kind of talk through it with each other and, and stay together um, through the process. And, and we're really, you know, really thankful for them um, for doing that. But also really impressed with, with their maturity throughout the process um, and, and understanding that, yeah, it, it was a rocky start to this season. But when you look at the, the total uh, of what we've done here at Penn State, there's no doubt that the future is extremely bright. And when they committed to us, Nothing had changed about what their future was going to be like here at Penn State and our future as a program. Got time for one more question, and then we got to wrap up practice for Coach Franklin. Uh, Audrey Snyder, The Athletic, go ahead. Sorry, I couldn't find you on mute button. Um, Andy, staying in state, uh, when you look at Philadelphia and the amount of talent that's coming out of there, um, how do you kind of assess the, the foothold that maybe you guys have there? What can you do better specifically in the city? Because it's so different than every other part of the state. Yeah, it is different than every other part of the state. Um, and, and in reality, this is an interesting statement that comes to recruiting because each of the areas have a different feel um, to how you recruit them. Um, you know, in terms of what have we done, we've had some coaching turnover. Um, and as a result, we, we've made some changes to you know, area coaches there. Um, Terry Smith, who in the past has recruited Pittsburgh and is still recruiting Pittsburgh, is now recruiting the, the city of Philadelphia. Um, and so that, that's been something that we, we've done. Um, and, and Terry's kind of hit the ground running while, you know, he's not necessarily – he was at Temple. Um, so he is, you know, familiar with it. He's a you know, Pittsburgh guy, you know, born and raised, but it, but has some familiarity with Philadelphia. And obviously being a longtime high school coach in the state has ties there. So I think that's been something that's been really good for us. Put a lot on his plate, um, but it's been something that's been good for us early on. Um, Dion Barnes, obviously, is a, is a Philadelphia product, is also, you know, on our staff as a graduate assistant now. And, and then we've got, you know, everybody is, is saturated in this state and, and, and placing an emphasis on that, you know, recruiting staff members um, have been doing a great job in the state, Philadelphia in particular, but all over the place. And then we, we've got, you know, the way that the rules work, um, we have some, some analysts who are not in the recruiting staff, but are on the kind of football side of things, but aren't coaches, um, that they're able to do some things in recruiting. And that's really helped us as well throughout the, this process this year. And also, especially kind of moving forward into, into future years. Andy, 